There's been so much talk about red light therapy, it's hard to tell what's true and what's hype. So in this episode, we're gonna break it all down for you to clear up that confusion, so stay tuned. Welcome back, my friends. My name is Sarah. I am known as Carnivore Yogi. Thank you so much for being here and clicking on today's video. Today, I sit down with Dr. Mike Belkowski, who is one of the world's leading experts on red light therapy. Now, Dr. Mike has done something extremely unique and compiled a manual, that's what I like to call it, of different types of applications for red light therapy. Again, everything from autism to cancer, to pain relief, to hair regrowth, to gut microbiome. The science is endless. There's even some studies being done now on fertility. So make sure that you check out those timestamps that are linked down in the show notes. And I also have a link for that manual under the BioLite link that you can grab that yourself. It's extremely inexpensive. And that way it'll kind of point you towards different times and usages that you're gonna to want to do for different types of issues. So again, that's all gonna be linked below. Dr. Mike and I really dive into the science of red light therapy. Why does it actually work? What can we use it for? And again, answer a lot of commonly asked questions. What's the difference between near infrared, far infrared? Can I just go into an infrared sauna or do I need to get a panel? Can I just do a sunrise walk? Is that the same thing? So we're gonna dive into all of that and more. Again, all of that's gonna be linked down in the timestamps for you guys if you wanna navigate around through this episode. And I also wanna pause really quickly to thank my two sponsors. The first one is going to be Viva Rays. Now, we talk a lot about circadian rhythms in this episode and how those are important to healing the body overall. So when you understand the importance of circadian rhythms, investing in something like the Viva Rays 3-in-1 system is extremely valuable. This is their clip and go system. This layer is for screens. The orange layer is for after sunset and the red layer is right before bed to help stimulate that melatonin production. They all clip on here together, super easy and convenient. My code Yogi will save you 15% on these and these glasses, unlike ones that you're gonna find on Amazon, have actually been time and tested with a spectrometer so they block out the rays of light that they say they do. So check out Viva Rays. The second sponsor of today's episode is gonna be Optimal Carnivore. This is their grass-fed organ meat complex. It is something that I have used prenatally, will definitely be using after my baby is born to fill in nutritional gaps, B vitamins, folate, so many things that we are missing if we are not eating organ meats. So use my code carnivore Y, uppercase Y, to save at Optimal Carnivore. There's a link down in the show notes. I hope you guys enjoyed today's episode and I will talk with you again soon. Thank you guys so much for coming back and tuning in. I am really excited to talk with today's guest. Dr. Mike Belkowski is, I consider, a major expert in red light therapy. He's got some really amazing resources that we're going to talk about today. But Dr. Mike, thank you so much for being here today. My pleasure, Sarah. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, I, I would love to know just to start off with how you as a practitioner became interested in red light therapy. Yeah. So kind of the origin story, if you will. <laughs> yes. So I'm a physical therapist by trade, graduated in uh, 2016 from the University of Montana. So go Grizz. Um, <laughs> but it was shortly after I graduated, I got the traditional allopathic outpatient uh, PT job. And it took me about, you know, two to three months for me to be really disgruntled with how I was being utilized, not just in the clinic, but within the system, especially insurances, because insurances dictate to a large degree how mm -hmm. you treat, because certain treatments, while they might not be as effective, get reimbursed more. So the clinic owner is going to want you to do certain treatments more often to get reimbursed more, even though they might not be more effective. Another way of saying that is, I may know of other treatments that may be more effective for the patient, but they won't get reimbursed as much. So we're kind of... uh not frowned upon, but it's like, you know, use these other codes so we get reimbursed more. So that whole system didn't uh, sit well with me. So I quickly left that job and started my own cash-based PT practice. Um, that way I don't have to take insurances and thus mm -hmm. insurances can't dictate how I treat. I can right. find the most 
effective treatment modalities within the scope of my PT practice, of course, uh, and utilize those for my patients so I can get them uh, well as quickly as possible or as effectively as possible. So uh, some of the unique treatment techniques I picked up were dry needling. So I became very well known for dry needling, which is amazing for pain, uh, reducing pain, uh, sometimes instantaneously. It can be mm -hmm. acute pain, chronic pain uh, of all types. And then cupping and uh, blood flow restriction training and hyperbaric oxygen therapy uh, chamber. And it was along this path of, of learning and uh, finding these, I guess we could call them uh, uh, alternative therapies, but I would call them like, they should be, they should be uh, everyday therapies. Um, it, was a, it was along this path where I found red light therapy up to that point. I didn't think much of light, just like mm -hmm. the majority of people, you know, the sun comes up, the sun comes down, we can, you know, turn a light bulb on and off. Uh, and I'd heard of red light therapy through podcasts because I was into biohacking for for many, many years. So listening to Ben Greenfield and others talk about red light therapy or photo biomodulation. Mm -hmm. Again, like you hear the information, it sounds cool, but I didn't really think much of it. Uh, and I get a lot of my books off Amazon, of course, and you get all these suggestions. And at a, at a one point, a red light therapy book was suggested that was highly, highly rated with a lot of reviews. So I couldn't ignore it. I had to at least read it. Um, I don't know if that book's behind me or not. Actually, it's down here. It's the one by Ari Witten. Uh, okay. So a very, very popular book. And his book is perfect for anyone with a scientific mind or just for the layman, the way he, the way he wrote it. So the first part of the book explains the mechanisms of how red light therapy works. And right away, there were some parallels between red light therapy and dry needling. And again, at that point, like I'm way into dry needling, I'm using it every day on my patients and I'm seeing amazing results and how dry needling can work in a nutshell is it helps reduce inflammation, improve circulation almost instantaneously. And two of the main mechanisms of red light therapy is reducing inflammation and improving circulation. And of course, the cherry on top is mitochondrial function, which we can get yes. into. Yes. But, but, but having those parallels was just like a light bulb went off, I guess, pun intended. And the second part of that book was basically the research behind it, which is thousands and thousands of uh, scientific peer reviewed scientific uh, articles that covers the gamut of health conditions, like from skin health to hair health, to pain, to sports performance, to thyroid health, to immune system uh, boosting and so on and so forth. But it's all backed by science uh, and reading that book. It's like, and even just talking about it when I'm on these podcasts, it sounds like a snake oil pitch after a while. But when you understand the mechanisms of how it works, you begin to understand how it can treat all of these, you know, health conditions. And so reading that book, again, was like a light bulb. And I wanted to see what the market had to offer. And this is back in late 2018, early 2019. Uh, and in my quick review, it seemed like there was these devices that were very expensive. And I didn't really know if the price uh, was justified for what it was producing. Mm -hmm. And then on the opposite side of the spectrum, you have these very cheap products. You know, I don't want to dog on Amazon, but you know, oh uh, yeah, <laughs> products that are 10, 20, $30. Uh, and you just don't really know the quality of that product. So I felt, and, and on top of that, I felt that there wasn't anyone, whether it was company or otherwise, that was putting out good information or education on red light therapy. It was just this very uh, regurgitated use it 20 to 30 minutes every day and it helps boost your energy, but it wasn't very thorough. And with my science background, I understood it, but I don't think the lay person would really be able to buy into it very well. And so again, I, if someone could come in, this was my mindset. If someone could come in, offer a superior product or line of products for a more affordable price. And of course, offer superior education, then I thought that demand could be there. And so that's why I started BioLite back in early 2019. And I started it and I was still practicing uh, in my solo practice full time with a with a full schedule. And so it kind of started as a hobby. Uh, but then over two, two and a half years, it went from BioLite being a hobby, and my my uh, my PT practice being full time to where uh, BioLite mm -hmm. took more time and energy because I was gaining more traction to the point where I am today, where BioLite's full time, and I no longer 
uh, treat patients. Um, so it's been an interesting journey. Never really expected this, but it's been amazing because uh, as a PT practitioner, I get to treat people hands-on, but I can only treat so many people in a day. Whereas with BioLite or just educating people through, uh, through, through the website or through my podcast, I'm able to affect uh, thousands and thousands of people um, and then some over, over time. So it, it's been a, it's been a fun, impactful journey. And just to be here on your podcast, sharing with your audience, you know, that's what it's all about for me. So I'm excited to be here and uh, talk some red light therapy. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's really exciting. And I, I love how you talk about that. There's the, I feel like the market is saturated now and it's continuing to get more and more saturated. And I get the questions constantly, you know, I'm kind of on the front lines of people who are interested in doing red light therapy and maybe they're a bit skeptical about it because like you said, it is kind of like a snake oil on the surface. You know, if you don't actually dive into the literature, if you don't actually read the information that's available and the studies that are available on red light, it does sound almost too good to be true. And so I'm, like I said, kind of on the front lines of getting questions from people on a daily basis, probably, because I'm always posting, you know, something in my story, because I we do red light therapy, either my husband's doing it, my daughter's doing it. Since I'm pregnant, I've been doing it like on my legs, and my back, I've been kind of staying away from the belly, because I haven't found a lot of research on that. But, you know, I'm always posting something about it. And so I think the the most common question I get is like, how do I choose a panel? You know, how do I why shouldn't I just go on Amazon and buy one of those $20, $30 panels. What's the difference between that and something commercial grade or something like that, that you would offer in your company? Yeah. So there's quite a few variables to consider. There's the safety factor. So we could start mm -hmm. there, the EMF emission and yes. light flicker. So probably your tribe is very savvy with EMF emission and the detriments it does to your, your cells and your health, you know, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, 5G, mm -hmm. all that good stuff it's light it's it's invisible to us but exactly it, it's non-native light so our body and our cells don't respond well to it um so emf emission anything that's plugged into electricity is going to have some so even bio light panels that plug into electricity they're going to have a little bit but we've mitigated it as much as possible whereas there's some companies that still integrate again Bluetooth, Bluetooth and wi-fi which just blows my mind me too um, please don't buy that <laughs> oh and that's honestly another one of the reasons i started biolite is because i saw this and they actually bought some of those panels and did a side by side with mine with an emf meter and and uh, a way to me measure light mm -hmm. flicker and it's astronomical i've never shared those videos because um you know i don't really know if there's a time and place for that or that's a whole other discussion but the yeah. point if people did emf readings on some of these panels their uh, socks would be knocked off it's incredible how high they are again i think the pros outweigh the cons but if this is something you're going to do on a regular basis then why inundate your cells with more emfs than than they need to be so that's one factor look for emf emission if someone's saying it's zero and it's a panel that's a lie yeah if it's a handheld device and it's running on a uh, rechargeable battery then that's of course uh possible or, or more than likely um and then light flicker it's kind of the same story it's one of these things we can't perceive with the naked eye but i mean just think about an office worker someone who's working under fluorescent oh lights, yeah eight hours a day five days a week uh they're probably dealing with some sort of uh concentration Dehydr issues or eye dehydration, dehydration chronic yeah. uh, headaches migraines mood and behavior disorders i mean this mm -hmm. is proven in the research and again, it's not something you can see or perceive. It just eats away at you mm -hmm. and your physiology slowly over time. So same thing. Why expose your body and your eyes and brain to that more than it needs to be? So BioLite, uh, this was about a year, year and a half ago. We were the first company to really take that on and reduce the light flicker as much as possible. Again, if it's plugged into electricity, there's going to be at least a little bit of light flicker, but not nearly as much. I mean, it's astronomical how high some of it is. Some of these light flickers are on other devices, but then same thing. If it's, if it's a rechargeable device, a handheld device, then it's going to have zero light flicker. Mm -hmm. So in a sense, the handheld devices are the quote unquote safest. Uh, the caveat is that you can't treat 
as large of an area at once. So that's another variable I wanted to speak about is what are your goals with red light therapy? Do you want to do some spot treatments? Do you want it to be portable, like on the go or take it from, you know, point A to point B, like someone else's house? Or is it something you just want established in a room? You want to do full body treatments um, and you don't really care about taking it anywhere. Um, so those are some of the biggest factors, I would say, the safety and then what's more important to you, treatment size or portability? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I think, think that's scary. the big ones because otherwise as far as like the the light spectrum like everyone's using very similar red light the 660 nanometers mm -hmm. pretty much everyone's using the 850 for near infrared so as far as the wavelengths very similar i guess another variable um is you want to look at the lens beam angle because um that also plays into light irradiance that was another factor sorry let's talk about light irradiance yeah. first because that's essentially the power of the light. More is not better. That's marketing hype to a certain degree. You do want it to be at least 100 milliwatts per centimeter squared or more. But when you get into the 140s, 50s, 160s and above, it's like, uh, that's not necessarily better. More is not better. And that's something I harp on. with my Yeah, that U upside down U-shaped curve when we talk about red light therapy is such an important point to bring up because it's like not going to do much perfect and then yep, exactly could the cause oxidative stress right yeah. yeah yeah let's talk about that in a second um yeah. but my point being is that more power does not equal more penetration the penetration of the light is literally uh due to the wavelength itself so the wavelength that 660 red is a shorter wavelength than the 850 uh, near infrared and that dictates the penetration not the power of the light the power of the light or the light irradiance um, just means there's more photons at a given time or distance. So if you have a higher or a higher powered uh, red light therapy panel, you're going to be getting more light photons at a given time, but it's not going to be penetrating deeper, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, so I think anywhere between 100 to 130 is optimal as far as getting a therapeutic dose. A lot of these uh, saunas that integrate quote unquote red light. Right. I think the light is more for ambiance, quite honestly. I haven't seen any mm -hmm. of those panels that have a high enough light irradiance to cause or give a therapeutic dosage. Um, better than nothing. And I guess if you're going to be in there for 30, 40 minutes, maybe, maybe you'll get some bang for your buck. But another differentiating factor, or I guess we need to get to the lens beam angle first because that has to do with light irradiance. Lens beam angle, typically people use 30 or 60 degrees. And this is important because most people use uh, 60 degrees, which means the light spreads quickly, which means you lose that light irradiance at a quicker rate. This is fine if you're going to be pretty close to the panel and you want the light to spread quickly and cover a lot of your body, especially if you have a smaller device. Uh, but once you start getting further than six inches away or so, you lose that light irradiance rapidly, uh, which can alter your treatment or your protocol significantly because the further you are away from the device, the more time you need for a certain protocol. Mm -hmm. I hope this is too confusing, but um, so we use a biolight, we use 30 degrees, which means it's less of an angle, meaning the light stays concentrated for a longer distance. So if you're 12 to 15 to 18 to two feet, inches away to two two feet away that light irradiance is going to hold for a longer period of time so you're still receiving a higher light irradiance at a greater distance if that makes sense absolutely i mean i've i've seen but... people get get too close to the devices and i don't know if this is on the same page but i've seen people get too close to the devices and they will have exacerbation of things like melasma or um, they'll, their skin will get kind of burnt a little bit. And, and I'm like, yeah, you're too, you don't have to be right on the thing. I don't think it's a great idea to do that in the first place. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Is that kind of on that same page or are we kind of jumping to something different? A little different um, for skin. I mean, just talking about skin, that's a good topic. It's one of the most popular oh, yeah. for, for light therapy for skin treatments. 
you don't want to be close because skin treatments take such a low dosage. Mm -hmm. Maybe we want to get into biphasic dose response now. Um, yeah. But compared to like treating joints or your brain or, you know, different organs, um, skin treatments take a fraction of the time. Mm -hmm. So kind of back to my origin story of most companies or, or, or these early influ influencers talking about red light therapy gave the, 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 this common theme of you need to do 20 to 30 minutes every single day, yeah. which based on the research I've read and, you know, my experience, that's massive over, uh, over treatment. The yeah. beautiful thing about red light therapy though, is even if you over treat, you're likely not going to see any negative ramifications. The only negative ramification is you're not going to see the results you're looking for. And so I think that that's one of my number one things I want people to take away is that with red light therapy, more is not better. Um, even people like maybe they use red light therapy right away and they, they feel energized and they're feeling mm -hmm. good because they did one 10 minute session. So they think that two 10 minute sessions um, every day is going to be better because, you know, more is better. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so kind of about the, uh, talking about this biphasic dose response, like you were saying, it's a, it's a bell shaped curve where if you're looking at it on the far left side of that curve is where the dosage is too low. You're just not getting enough light, uh, which would be in the form of jewels. So you're not going to get the results you're looking for. The, the dosage is too low. On the far right, where I think the, the vast majority of people are, just because of that mindset mm -hmm. um, or what they've been told, is the dosage is too high. So their body's absorbing too many joules of light energy. And again, you're not going to get the results you're looking for. So it's all about finding that treatment under that bell curve. So you want the right amount of joules to elicit the response you're looking for based on what you're treating. Cause like you're talking about with skin health, for example, you'd want to use red light at about, you know, 15, 18 inches away for a couple of minutes. That's ample. Your skin's going to get some nice benefits from that several times a week, not every day necessarily. Um, in fact, just like exercise, you want to give your body and your cells rest. Yes. From high dosage of or concentrated form of red and near infrared light. But compare that skin treatment to, let's say, treating the brain, where you'd want to use near infrared uh, about six inches away for about 10 minutes. Mm. So vastly different protocols, but that's because of the target tissue. Skin's the most superficial tissue, so it doesn't need, uh, the light doesn't need to travel through all of the skin and the bone to get to the brain. It's superficial, so it doesn't take as much light. Um, and I guess that brings up another point of red versus near infrared. Yeah. People need to Very understand. common question. Yeah. Yeah. And when we talk about red light therapy, I, whenever I say that it encompasses both red and near infrared because they treat, they elicit the exact same responses physiologically, the reduced inflammation, improved circulation, mitochondrial health. They do the exact same thing, just at different layers or different levels in the body. Red light only treats the skin. It doesn't go any deeper because it's a shorter wavelength. Whereas near infrared, again, is a longer wavelength, so it penetrates deeper. So it's going to treat things like the bone, joints, the brain, kind of like we talked about before. So if you're treating anything deeper than the skin, you must use near infrared. Um, red light is only for treating the skin or for uh, wound healing. Mm -hmm. I'm sure there's some downstream effects for your eyes picking up the, the wavelength of red and for eye health itself. But that's the basic tenets of red versus near infrared, which is <laughs> brings up another rabbit hole of red light therapy versus mm -hmm. infrared sauna, because there's that yes. infrared word that throws people off. So just like red is shorter than near infrared, red is visible, near infrared is not, it's an invisible. Um, so when people have their devices on, we were talking about this before the recording, but if you have your red light therapy device on and some of the LEDs look like they're off. Well, that's probably the near infrared mm -hmm. uh, being shot your way. You just can't see it with the human eye. But again, just like red is shorter than near infrared, near infrared is quite a bit shorter than mid and far infrared. Yep. The mid and far is what's, pre what's predominantly utilized in infrared saunas. Mm -hmm. and that's why you get that nice detox because those wavelengths being longer, they penetrate even deeper. So you get that deep sweat, that detox, uh, cardiovascular benefits and all that good stuff. But... Mid and far infrared does not stimulate the mitochondria 
like red and near infrared near light. Red. So when people ask, and I get this question all the time, I'm sure you do too. Oh yeah. Like which which uh, treatment modality should I invest in or what should I buy or what should I be using? Red light therapy or infrared sauna. And that's like saying, should I eat, you know, an apple or an orange? They're completely different yes. treatment modalities, treat different uh, benefits. In a perfect world, you're using both on a consistent basis. It's not one versus the other. Um, if I were to choose one, I don't know, I would want to use both, but if I were to choose one, it would be red light therapy, which sounds yeah. biased, but that's because of the implications of boosting your mitochondrial health and what that has to do with your entire uh, health, wellness, and longevity potential. So um, yeah, next question <laughs> <laughs> or any other thoughts you have on that. Yeah. I mean, just jumping back to something you said way earlier, it's funny with some of these panels, you know, I follow other influencers. I, I like to kind of see what other people are doing, what they're talking about. And it's kind of astounding to me. Just, I, I feel like podcasts like this are so important to really educate people on these things. Number one, you know, using your EMF meter, I've got a tri-field too, that I keep and just <laughs> measure like, oh, <laughs> Yeah. It's like, that's my entry level meter that I'm always, I'm like, te we just it's moved a, into this house and it's like, it's a scary tool. Yeah. But it's, I mean, I mean, it's good to know it's information you yeah. need to know, but it's, it's kind of scary to see how many things really set off. Oh yeah. The meter. It's, it's terrifying. Yeah. I have a freaking belly band on. I have my whole pregnancy, like the get lambs belly band. I've got, I mean, I'm trying to do everything I can to mitigate um, cause I, once you see that you kind of can't unsee it, but that's important. And then the flicker thing, I, like I was saying, I, I watch so many different influencers and I'll see them with their panel in the background doing a reel or something. And that thing is just flashing. I'm like, oh my God, <laughs> it's like the emperor with no clothes. You know, it's so hard for me not to say something. But I think that education for people is, is super, super, super important. And, and just understanding, um, you know, again, sauna versus the, the, the sauna, the infrared sauna versus the red light therapy. Again, two totally separate things. I hope you guys are enjoying today's video with Dr. Mike Belkowski. I just wanted to pause for a moment to remind you to head down to the show notes to check out that BioLite link if you want to get that manual that Dr. Mike and I talk about in this episode. Also to ask if you wouldn't mind, if you're enjoying this episode, to please hit that like button, leave me a comment, even if it's thank you, and share this video out with anybody who you feel could be helped. I also wanna thank one more sponsor of today's episode. That's gonna be Upgraded Formulas. Now, a lot of people really talk about a magnesium deficiency, how magnesium plays all these important roles in the body, but how do you know if you actually need it if you don't test? Now, a blood serum test is just going to tell you what's happening right now. A hair tissue mineral analysis is going to tell you what's been going on over the last 60 to 90 days inside your body. So that's why I love the upgraded formulas hair tissue mineral analysis with a consultation because those can be a little bit tricky to read in helping you to understand your mineral balance. Do you have low sodium, low potassium, low magnesium, or maybe you're supplementing with too much of these things and it's causing other issues. So when it comes to supplementing with minerals, over supplementing or under supplementing can lead to all sorts of issues like issues with sleep, hair loss, fatigue, muscle aches, muscle cramps. So make sure that you test these things rather than guess. Use my code YOGI or YOGI12 to save over at Upgraded Formulas and check out their link down in the show notes. All right, guys, again, thank you so much for listening to today's episode with Dr. Mike. If you are enjoying it, make sure to let me know so I can continue to bring you content that you do enjoy that you find relevant. Thanks again for watching and I will talk with you guys again really, really soon. Have an awesome day. Um, one question I get a lot is because a lot of my listeners are, are because they've been following me for the last year, my part of my fertility journey and getting pregnant over the age of 40, I'm 43 now and 32 weeks pregnant, it has been light and understanding light and changing out light bulbs in my house and, you know, doing all the weird, crazy stuff. And so one thing I get asked a lot is, you know, what about LED bulbs on a red light therapy device? Isn't that bad? And my response is always like, not, not all LED lights are bad. I mean, uh, what's, what do you say about, about that topic? 
Well, it's more so what is that LED producing? Um, right, exactly. The LEDs, I think most people are referring to are that bright white blue light, which in excess or especially at night is going to throw off your circadian right. rhythm and cortisol levels and all that jazz. Um, there's obviously a time and place for blue light. I mean, that's how you wake up in the morning. That's how you, you know, decrease melatonin, and increase cortisol. So that's part of the circadian rhythm. Um, but to your point or the question at hand, the LEDs in these these uh, uh, panels or devices are emitting red light at a specific wavelength and near infrared. So it's not necessarily um, about it being an LED versus a laser. I mean, I don't know what else you would use. You surely wouldn't get the same dosage using an incandescent bulb or a right. light. You know what I mean? So yeah. um, I don't know if that really answered your question, but it's more about what's being emitted from that LED versus it being an LED. Yeah, that's exactly what I say. And and I just wanted to know if you had a different answer than what I had on that topic. Yeah. Well, well, and kind of, you know, taking a little a detour, because most of the research, especially the early research for photobiomodulation, which again is a fancy term for red light therapy, mm -hmm. they use lasers. And so you don't need a laser because according to Dr. Michael Hamblin, who's a, a PhD researcher out of Harvard, considered one of the top photobiomodulation experts in the world. So he does a lot of research and he reads and synthesizes all the research. And he's found that when you compare the research that uses lasers versus LEDs, you get comparable results minus the uh, potential for injury and the, uh, the price point of lasers. Pri uh, lasers are very expensive mm -hmm. and you do have the potential to burn or, or heat up tissue, which is not a good thing. So the fact that we can use LEDs and get the same results as these laser studies is phenomenal because that's what a lot of the research is cited, even on the BioLite website is this uh, using LLLT, which is low level laser therapy, mm -hmm. but we can get the similar results with, with LEDs. It's just about getting that dosage right. Um, and as long as you do that, you're, you're golden. Yeah. And I guess on the topic of, of dosage, cause I get that quite a bit, you know, everyone always wants to message me and say, you know, how long should I, like we were talking about, how long should I sit in front of my panel? How often should I do it? And I, I'm always like, it depends. I mean, what are, what are your goals? What are you trying to accomplish? So can, maybe we can dive into that topic, just a little bit of how you'd want to do it different for different applications. Correct. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's uh, the answer I tell people too. It's, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's dependent on what your goals are. Cause again, like we were explaining with the, just the, those two different protocols, skin versus brain health, mm -hmm. vastly different, um, different in the duration of that one treatment and in different, uh, vastly different in the frequency per week. Uh, gosh. So yeah, it's like on a case and everyone responds differently to light. You and I mm -hmm. might try to uh, treat the same pain or improve our skin, but our biology is going to respond slightly different uh, uh, to, to the light for various reasons, whether it's age, sex, what medications are you taking? What's your general health status? I mean, um, the healthier you are, the more you'll be able to take away from your body's going to be able to accept it and utilize it better. But with that being said, healthier people, you're not going to notice much with red light therapy because you don't have that much room for improvement. Whereas people that, you know, like they need a detox, they really need a uh, get their body going or, or get some healing going on, they're going to notice some remarkable results because they have such a uh, difference to make up to get to their to their homeostasis or their their uh, health, normal health level, so to speak. Um, so there's a lot of variables. And I tell people, if you're interested in red light therapy, you think it's something you're probably going to utilize going forward because you're buying into the research and the information that's out there, and maybe some results you've heard from friends and family. Uh, the best bang for your buck, I would say, is full body mm -hmm. because that way you're getting the systemic benefits of red light therapy on a consistent basis. Again, back to the anti-inflammatory, pro-circulatory, mitochondrial boosting properties, especially people dealing with systemic issues or autoimmune mm -hmm. issues. Getting that full body is just, there's, there's, nothing, there's nothing like it. Um, yeah. So with that being said, it's like, how, how long should a person be using it just for general health? Even, um, even if it's a smaller device or full body device, I would say for general health maintenance, 
uh, two to three times a week for, I don't know, five to 10 minutes each session. That's a very global answer because uh, if you have a smaller device, you can only do a smaller portion at a time. So you would actually need to be doing more time, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So it's like this, it's tough to answer this. Um, yeah. You know, just to a general audience. And I would also say that that changes based on the time of year. Like right now, I live in Montana. So in the summertime, I'm getting as much sun as I can. Exactly. Same but November here. through April, it's like not much sunlight. So I'm doing a right. lot more red light therapy then, whereas now I'm not doing much at all. Maybe for some uh, wound healing or some mental health or some skin stuff here and there. But uh, I don't use it nearly as much as I do in the winter. Yeah, I'm, I'm the same exact way. I mean, it's summer here. I live in Atlanta, Georgia, and I'm trying to sunbathe as much as I can. And obviously out there it's sunrise and sunset. Those are the only times a day. It's not too hot to walk for me, but I try to be outside at those times. Anyway, that's when you get natural red light is that's the highest concentration at sunrise and sunset. And so, yeah, summertime, I don't feel like it's as much needed, you know, for my daughter, we're still doing it because she just is constantly bumping her head on things like she and and I've read some interesting research about, um, you know, brain protection. And if you hit your head or get a concussion, I've heard now that they're using red light therapy, like kind of preventatively if somebody has a head injury. Um, and so that's, you know, with her, it's like if she's got a bump or something to hurt her head. I'm like, we're doing panel. You know, I don't care what time of year it is. So yeah, it's, it's hard to give anyone, I mean, with anything in health, it's hard to give general recommendations. That's why I've been, like we talked about before I turned the camera, pointing a lot of people towards your work. So you've got a pretty extensive, I mean, I would call it kind of a manual. I don't know if I could really call it a book, but Let's talk about that a little bit as a resource that people listening to this might be able to jump to if they want specific applications, right? Yeah, it's definitely meant to be more of a resource than a book you would read cover to cover. <laughs> yeah. um, so it's in its fourth edition. I just updated it uh, within the last several weeks. I update it once or twice, once uh, one or two times a year. And the first part of the ebook isn't, and I get this question all the time, why aren't there hard copies? And that's because it gets updated so frequently that mm -hmm. it would be a fiasco logistically to print them and have to keep reprinting updated uh, versions. But anyway, the first part of the book is a lot of this information you and I are talking about, some general concepts and considerations you'd want to uh, take when utilizing red light therapy, just like the dosage, how would you want to use it? Um, why are the mitochondria important? Why is red and near infrared important? And then the second part of the book, which is probably like 90% of the ebook, is all these different sections, kind of similar to the website where, it, for example, um, anxiety, depression, and stress. So the there's a section for that. And there's several paragraphs, if not a couple of pages about how red light therapy can impact, you know, major depressive disorder or anxiety or stress. And then the second part of that section is uh, all of the relevant research about photobiomodulation and, and mental health. And then the last part are specific protocols I've developed based on uh, some of that research. Some of the sections have maybe one protocol. Some of them have three, four, five, six, um, you know, just depending on what the health condition is. So that's just for one health condition, but there's, I think, two dozen health conditions, meaning a lot of sections of, you know, information research, but probably most importantly, those protocols that people would uh, seek out. And so I developed that because it just seemed like such a low hanging fruit, something oh, yeah. that the masses needed, because just like you and I are talking about, people are, I think, more so buying into the technology or the the concept of red light therapy, but like you, you get it. And it's like, how do I use it? Right. You know, exactly. um, and while it's a basic piece of technology in a sense that it's emitting just two wavelengths of light. Uh, there are some strategies or just some concepts you need to understand in order to utilize it uh, most effectively. Uh, so that's why I developed the ebook. And so, you know, I appreciate that you have found it to be a useful resource. And it's one of those things where it's just going to continue to grow and, uh, you know, garner more and more information. And as the research comes out, the protocols will be updated and more will be added. So I think it will be a pretty solid resource. Uh, going forward for those interested in uh, 
just utilizing their red light therapy device uh, as effectively as possible. Yeah. And like you were talking about, there's so many different applications for it. I had a, a client of mine the other day that was messaging me and she, she ate, you know, ate something that had elevated her blood sugar, kind of skyrocketed it. And she's like, I went for a walk. I, you know, did all the things that we're supposed to do to get the blood sugar down. It was still up there. She's like, I sat in front of my panel for 10 minutes and check my blood sugar again. And it was back to baseline. And she's like, have you ever heard of anything like that? And I'm like, no, but that's wild. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> like that's crazy. There's not a lot of research on, you know, uh, diabetes or mm -mm. blood sugar levels in red light therapy. So that's a really interesting anecdote. Yeah, it was very, I'm like, okay, well, I know it can help get you into your parasympathetic nervous system. I know that. So that could be mm -hmm. a big part of it, but I had never heard <laughs> the That's actual yeah i've heard i mean i've heard all kinds of stuff because a lot of my clients i'm like hey i know it sounds crazy but this is something i also want you doing as part of your overall wellness protocol i think the red light therapy is is important i have a lot of people with gut issues mm. that have seen i mean in myself included um have seen amazing results because i was trying to treat my ovaries you know i was trying to get these guys fired up again and um <laughs> obviously worked but as a side effect of treating that part of my body i was able to start eating uh raw dairy with zero issues i mean foods that had previously given me major problems no issues i mean nothing no gut issues i mean it was just nothing short of amazing so i mean there's just there's so many things like you're treating one thing and then oh my eyesight's getting better how is that possible <laughs> you know that's exactly right. It's like a Swiss army knife of, of healing modalities. Like you're saying, that's a perfect example. You're going to treat one thing, but you end up walking away with like three, four or five, six benefits. Right. Um, and to your point with the gut health, I think that's one of the more exciting uh, oh, yeah. the aspects of research. red light therapy. There's a lot of new research coming out on its effect, not just on the gut, because we know that it can improve gut microbiome by uh, improving the ratio of, of beneficial bacteria to harmful yeah. bacteria, which is cool enough. But then we have this thing called the gut brain axis. So we see this research coming out where you can improve or mitigate or prevent Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease yeah. symptoms just by treating the gut, not even directing it at the brain, which is wild. And, I, and, and just mood in general, mm -hmm. of course. Guts where most of your serotonin is produced plus the gut brain axis. So the gut is actually one of the treatments I'll do on a semi-consistent basis, not because I'm trying to treat anything, but just because of those benefits are, are there just... Uh, why wouldn't you? Yeah. Um, uh, who was this? Um, not Socrates, Hippocrates, you know, yeah. um, all diseases begin in the gut. So, you know, any, anything to optimize your gut health was, will lead to systemic health. Um, and that's another reason why we developed the, the guardian, which is a mouthpiece. Oh yeah. That when integrates talk to you about red, that. And, red and near infrared light. So just like we have the gut microbiome, we have the, the oral, oral microbiome, which I didn't really know about a lot until I got into this red light therapy thing. But uh, talking to a couple of uh, biological dentists, I was blown away about the impact of your oral health on your entire health. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess I was in this world where it's like, you know, I'll brush my teeth and, you know, floss and whatever, just to keep my mouth clean. But the ramifications and, uh, to your entire body is mind blowing. So again, if you can improve your oral microbiome, again, restore that balance of, of bacteria, that's going to lead to a lot of health benefits elsewhere. Um, if you can improve your gut health through your oral microbiome, then you could potentially improve your brain health, mm -hmm. your oral microbiome kind of through that, uh, that triangle and vice versa. So it's pretty wild. Um, yeah. yeah, that's another exciting avenue or, or not avenue, but uh, area is oral health. That's one of the areas mm -hmm. that might have the most research for, for red light therapy. Really? Uh, yeah, just because there's a lot of post-surgical things. So if you can accelerate the wound healing process and gum uh -huh. health, uh, you know, dentists and, and uh, orthodontists are going to love that. So that and eye health. I mean, if you look at the ebook, eye health has one of the largest oh, yeah. sections, which is kind of mind blowing because people, it, it, we get under this impression that this bright light is not good for our eyes. And while that's partially true, you don't want to look straight into at these it. bright LEDs. Uh, the 
the implications are mind blowing, red and near infrared light. And the reason I say you don't want to look into the bright light is because if you look at the research for eye health, the amount of joules, again, that light energy it takes to see beneficial effects is very, 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 very low compared to a normal uh, red light therapy treatment. So if you have one of these panels or devices that has that normal 100 to, you know, 130 milliwatts, I mean, you wouldn't want to look straight into a red light or no. not for very long because uh, the eyes don't take that much. Again, mm -hmm. if you look at the research, um, a lot of them are like a fifth to an eighth of the light irradiance compared to these more typical treatments. So I want people to understand that you can get benefits, but the dosage is quite low. Yeah. Absolutely. Most of the time my eyes are closed if I'm facing the panel, exactly. but I'll yep. open them a little bit. I don't wear the goggles, which some of the companies send the goggles out and everyone's like, should I wear the goggles? I'm like, I'm not going to tell you what to do, but I don't wear them. <laughs> it's know? a liability thing, quite honestly. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. I do the same thing. I keep my eyes closed. Uh, if you are light sensitive, of course, you know, cover yeah. them, whether it's goggles or bandana or what have you. Um, but I mean, for example, I think this research came out last fall or winter. One, I don't remember how long the treatment was. One treatment in the morning with red light improved visual uh, acuity and color acuity for an entire week, that one treatment. Uh, but the second part of that research is that when they did that exact same treatment, but in the afternoon, there was zero benefit. Really? So the research showed that there can be a timing effect for oh. certain organs or what they called it is like they're the, the mitochondria can work in shifts. So yeah, apparently in the eye, they're much more responsive in the morning versus the afternoon. Not at all. Interesting. Well, it might be a good idea for people with eyesight issues to start getting out for sunrise. 100%. <laughs> I've seen my eyesight improve. I mean, just in the last year, I was, I was like, well, I'm getting over 40. I remember not being able to read something across the room. And that was before I started implementing blue blockers and like light therapy and just being outdoors more. Um, now, no problems. My eyesight has completely gotten better in the last year. And I know red light therapy, blue blockers, and just daily sunrise viewing has been the key. And again, that's the biggest concentration of red light that you can get. Um, which brings me to a question, which I get a lot. And I, my, I, I want to know your answer versus what I always tell people. There are a lot of practitioners out there that say, you don't need to buy a panel, just go outside during sunrise and sunset. My answer is always, it's not a therapeutic dose on your mm -hmm. body and skin. You can't move the sunrise or <laughs> go out there naked. Sure. Um, if you want to do that, but how would that really be different? than getting a panel and doing treatments on yourself. Yeah, you you hit the nail on the head. Um, while the sunrise and sunset is the highest uh, proportion of red light throughout the day, it is not a therapeutic dose, so to speak, compared to, I mean, that's what these panels have up on the sun is they're a higher concentration of red and a higher concentration of near infrared light. Uh, but as you and I, you and I know in your audience, that morning sunrise even you know the other wavelengths that come along with the red mm -hmm. is uh so invaluable for your health i actually did a series of podcasts on my um solo shows on my podcast about the impact of light on your health light through your eye on your health meaning your entire physiological system is impacted by what light your eye perceives. Mm -hmm. It's mind blowing. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't know if you've read this book. It's it's like all the research is from the late 1800s and early to mid 1900s. It's by Frank uh, Hallwich. But it's like your your hormones, your mm -hmm. nervous system, your cardiovascular system, your your blood sugar levels, and of course your sleep wake cycle. Everything is impacted by your eye perceiving or not perceiving light. Um, it's wild. So, oh, yeah. so again, 100%. like in the morning sunrise, extremely important, especially if you're going to be indoor most of the day. I mean, that alone, even if you do nothing else could drastically, uh, improve your health. Yeah. But to, to answer your question at hand, yeah, like you said, it's not the same dosage. Like if you're trying to treat pain in your shoulder or you're trying to improve, um, 
what i don't know gut health thyroid health maybe it'll help a little bit but the red light therapy is what's going to really move the needle uh quickly quicker yeah absolutely i agree yeah i think uh, that's just a myth that's kind of been per perpetuated but it is important for your health i mean i did a post i think it was yesterday day before yesterday that really pissed off a lot of people and i said basically looking at your phone first thing instead of the sunlight all the things that it does to your body elevates cortisol messes up your dopamine even messes up your melatonin which no daily you know looking at your phone in the morning is not going to mess up your melatonin for that night i'm like you want to bet mm -hmm. <laughs> you know it, it really makes people upset when you start to talk about these things but yeah, it's, it's profoundly simple and we've known about it for, you know, a couple hundred years, if not longer. I mean, obviously we evolved that way. However, I think in our modern world, we just want to brush it under the rug and think technology is better and, you know, going to do more for us looking at our phone than, than just going outside. So, yeah, but on the, on the red light side, I do think getting outside, letting your eyes be exposed is important, but also using a panel for therapeutic dosages is, is going to be very beneficial, which brings me to, and you kind of touched on this already, the times of day that are optimal to use red light therapy. Now that's a, the, when you said that about the eyes in the morning, that's the first time I had heard that there was like some kind of a circadian uh, response to that, that, that application. But I've always just told people, you know, do it during the day while the sun is up and try not to do it at night. What is your, do you give a general recommendation like that? Or do you find people can do it at night and they're, and they're okay. So where do we want to go with this? Um, <laughs> I mean, wise, yeah. Kind of go back to that research. I think that's the first one that's uh, succinctly proven that there may be a timing mechanism in certain tissues or certain organs of your body. So I really hope, you know, in the coming years, we'll have more of this type of research that defines which mitochondria in which tissues respond at which times of the day for optimal treatment. Cause it's like, if you're doing, if you're trying to improve your eye health and you're doing some of your red light therapy treatments in the afternoon, well, apparently you may be getting no benefit at least there's no mm -hmm. harm but, um but as far as a general recommendation i tell people to use it when you can because i think mm -hmm. if people's schedules are so busy and they get so flustered with feeling like they have to throw in red light therapy at the specific time in the day versus going with the ebb and flow and just doing it when they can that's kind of what i tell people in general also you need to figure out if you're a person that's energized or relaxed by red light therapy because mm -hmm. you may be one or the other or a mix or maybe you're just neutral but some people get quite energized so of course you wouldn't want to use that an hour or two before bed um and if you get like really sedated and relaxed maybe you don't want to do that before you know a big day at work especially if it's cognitively intensive um but if you're someone who is kind of neutral i don't see a problem with using it at night yeah See, my uh, husband doesn't listen to me. <laughs> well, so, so he, he does it at night and he's, I mean, he's seen his hair grow back in, which is right. amazing, but he, he's nine o'clock at night. I'm going to bed and he's downstairs <laughs> with, <laughs> with the panel on his head. I'm like, you don't listen to me. And he's like, oh, he falls asleep just fine. So. <laughs> right. And there may be something to that. I mean, another timing mechanism or suggestion is uh, use it the same times that the sun would come up and sun would go down. Of course mm -hmm. not not uh trying to persuade people not to be outside with the sunrise sunset but right if you're going to emulate that timing then you could help normalize your circadian rhythm actually which of course has you know a multitude of health benefits yeah. um and red is actually the one visible wavelength that doesn't inhibit your melatonin production whereas you know green and blue and yellow and mm -hmm. uh, uh indigo or whatever all those have have different potentials to inhibit melatonin and increase cortisol but red doesn't so as far as ruining the melatonin production or the sleep wake cycle red seems to be the one that doesn't in fact like i said it can be quite relaxing and soothing so again n equals one go see see how you respond to red light uh, me personally i can use it 
while I'm in bed or before bed, or, you know, a lot of times I'm in bed with my shine handheld device and I'm doing, you know, a treatment on my brain or a treatment on my gut. It's near infrared. So I'm not, I'm not, uh, getting it in your eyes, perceiving the light, yeah. but, um, I am sending signals to my, to my cells and mitochondria and it hasn't, uh, you know, decreased my sleep quality, at least to my knowledge. And I wear yeah. a bio trap, so it seems to work. Yeah, I mean, we use the panels to illuminate the home in the winter time when the sun goes down here super early. I'm like, I've got panels on the floor in different rooms, and my house looks like <laughs> people who walk by here like, what is, what is going on in that house? It's like red light district, like because the house <laughs> kind of glows red in the winter. But that's kind of how I, I mean, with an autistic child, people are always like, they don't sleep. Kids and I was told that her whole life, like, oh, she's just not going to sleep because she has autism. And I, once I started understanding circadian rhythms, using it on myself, using it with my clients, I started applying it to her and she sleeps great. I mean, she sleeps amazing. And that was the thing that we did this winter, you know, to kind of wind everybody down. We don't have a bunch of screens and stuff. We have the red light on. We're still eating dinner and kind of hanging out and doing our evening stuff, reading books and all that. But yeah, I found it to be really soothing and very complimentary to just, you know, <laughs> instead of having a bunch of LEDs on, like the, the big blue light LEDs, just keeping panels on. And that actually helped us sleep better, but I never would, ap you know, apply it on the body. My husband always would, but yeah, I think everyone again is different in that regard. Have you seen some of the, the research, red light therapy research on autism that has come out recently? I have not. I would be very interested to to hear about that though, because we've actually been, one of the, the yeah. one of the sections I added to the ebook here under Ooh. brain and cognitive health. I'm actually looking at it here, and like for example, one of the pieces of research I cite, um, which is from May 2022, says um, a relevant reduction in non-compliant behavior and in parental stress have been found. Moreover, a reduction in behavioral and cognitive rigidity was reported as well as an improvement in attentional functions and in sleep quality. Wow, that's that, that's just like one little conclusion. And I actually do have a protocol for autism in the ebook based on some of that research. Oh, awesome. I'll have to check that out because my daughter comes home from school now and she'll ask for it. Like she wants to lay down and do the panel. I'm like, okay, you don't lay down for anything. Like She's not still for, we literally have a swing hanging from the ceiling in there. She has to stay active, mm -hmm. um, but she will be totally chill and lay down for red light therapy. Doesn't need any distraction. She just loves it. So I'll have to check that section out. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I tell, I have a lot of people that follow me that have kids with autism also. And I'm like, it's worth a shot you know, it's, it's worth a shot to help them because she, I definitely see a difference with her. Yeah. I'm just looking at the protocol now. It's kind of a more intricate one just because it was a specific piece of research, but you would treat the front of the brain. So the frontal lobe, you ah. would treat the side of the brain and then potentially intranasal. So up the nose to get a different aspect of the frontal oh. lobe of the brain. Um, near infrared only, of course, because you're trying to affect the brain. So yeah, frontal lobe, both sides of the skull and up the nose. Interesting. Okay. So I obviously haven't been doing up the nose, but that's where, what, that's what I do with her is I have her lay on the ground and I'll do one side of her head, other side of her head. And then we do the top of her head. And sometimes I'll have her face it for, and I just like two minutes, two minutes, two minutes, two minutes. Like we don't stand, oh. we don't stay up there forever. Right. But yeah, I just kind of move it around on her head and she just absolutely loves it. So let's talk mm. about up the nose thing though. Cause that's uh, something that you have with, uh, with BioLite, right? Do you have something that will go up the nose also or no? Oh, well, we don't have an intranasal specific product. Uh, the most popular one is Violite. Okay. That's that. the one I've heard. Yeah. I've heard about that yep. one. Yep. So, I mean, again, you're just attacking or you're having to go through less tissue to, uh, get to the brain. get to the brain. Whereas Otherwise, you're going through the skin, you're going through the skull, and like a very small percentage is making it to the brain, but it's that small percentage that makes a pretty big difference. So it's not a bad thing. It's just, it's another way to attack that frontal lobe, which is where a lot of the mood and behavioral mm -hmm. mental stress is uh, relegated. It's in that frontal lobe. Interesting. I don't know if she'd let me put anything in her nose, but. <laughs> <laughs> well, you don't even need it in the nose. It's like, if, if you have a device, just you can angling it. Yeah. 
Ah, okay, that's a great idea. Or just have her tilt her head back head or something. Back. Yeah, yeah, we can do that. Cool. That's exciting. What are what are some other really exciting applications that you found just I guess recently that that maybe not a lot of people are talking about? Hmm. Well, the autism is a big one. Um, I mean, shoot, that's only a couple months old. Uh, again, we talked about this already, but I think the gut health is mm-hmm. massive. And I think we're only uh, scratching the surface of a lot of the research that will come out. But that gut brain axis, just being able to improve your gut health, mm-hmm. um, whether it's for mood disorders, again, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, ulcerative uh, colitis. Um, gosh, you already brought it up. Concussions. That was another big one. That's another relatively new one where I think it's going to become uh, a staple in hopefully in sports, hopefully there's mm-hmm. something on the sideline, whether it's football, soccer, or what have you, where someone gets, you know, their, their bell rung. And the first thing that's being applied is some sort of red light therapy device to help kind of move that uh, healing process along. Um, oh, let's see. Cancer. I mean, that's a section I oh, really? And it's pretty wild because it's much more safe than people would think. You, you would anticipate the, that the uh, since it increases energy, Right. Um, That's what the I, first thing I thought. Yeah. Yeah. You would think that it would help like multiply the, the cells, but in fact, it does the opposite. Um, oh. It's actually anti-tumor um, in a sense. No protocol um, I couldn't develop because there's uh, there's not enough research. And the research in the cancer is kind of all over the place where the different uh, treatment techniques they use, the different wavelengths, it's all over the, the spectrum. Um, so I haven't been able to develop a a protocol yet, but there's a lot of information and a decent amount of research I've cited there for people interested. Um, heart health was another one I added a lot of research to. Again, I don't have a protocol because just like cancer, there's a lot of different uh, types of heart conditions and there's just not enough robust uh, research to develop a specific protocol, but the research that is there is quite intriguing. Um I mean, this isn't really new or anything, but like the immune system and a lot of the research mm-hmm. that came out during COVID showing how red light therapy was actually very, very beneficial for either staving off or helping people heal from uh, COVID. So that's relatively wild. Um, inflammation, of course. Mm-hmm. Uh, oral health, pain, pet health. I guess that's another one most people don't talk about is no. just like we have mitochondria. So do our, our pets, our, our dogs and cats and, and horses. So, you know, red light therapy in the equine, um, am I saying that right? Equine? I think so. <laughs> Got too fancy for my own good horse industry. <laughs> it, they've been using red light therapy for quite a while, just using like different wands to treat uh, joint pain or, or muscle pain or, you know, if they're limping. Um, so actually, you know, I'll, I'll announce it here that BioLite, we're about to... Um, not release, but we'll start a campaign on a red light therapy specific product for pets. Oh, wow. We'll have that coming down the pipeline pretty soon. Um, yeah, we have a couple, we have a handful of pretty innovative products coming down the pipeline the next, you know, uh, uh, two to four months or so. Uh, s- some products that the industry has never seen to this point, And that includes the, the pet health. Uh, but again, like, like I was saying with mitochondria and pets, if they have pain, if they have skin conditions, if they're uh, healing from wounds, same principles apply as far as how they respond to red and near infrared light. Um, stem cells. Mm-hmm. So if you're getting a stem cell treatment, it'll help that. I think a lot of stem cell centers, if they're not already, are going to start integrating red light therapy because it's, it's going to make their uh, treatments more effective. Um, there's even some research showing if you shine it in certain places, you may be able to stimulate more stem cell production or release or mobility, that kind of thing. Uh, those are the big ones. Women's health is another one. Um, oh yeah. I saw my course. testosterone go from like a five up into like almost a hundred. And that was, I think wow. one of the reasons why I was having an issue getting pregnant because my DHEA was low. Testosterone was low. That uh, greatly affects egg quality. And I think so many women are suffering with this, you know, that, that maybe aren't on the PCOS side that are suffering with the low testosterone issues that can cause a multitude of things. Even if you're not trying to get pregnant, a lot of health issues. And so, you know, and that was me in my early forties. I think if you're 
a little older than that in your 50s as a female, you may need a little extra help in that department, but was completely able to just with red light therapy, I also did some cold plunging, you know, circadian rhythms, no major dietary changes, just able to get that number up. And so I know there's some research on uh, testosterone or red light therapy too, right? No. I was no. just going to bring up that it's like, it's interesting. It's your an anecdotal anecdote. type of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Because both with fertility, uh, cause I've seen maybe, maybe two, two, maybe three, I lied Two, maybe three articles yeah. on fertility testosterone. There's none. Wow. Okay. But to your point, lots of anecdotes. Uh, so a lot of these influencers like Ben Greenfield was mm -hmm. you know, raving about it years ago. Um, I had a, a, a major league pitcher who showed me his wellness FX and his testosterone level was just like, not great. And then he's like, this is where I started using red light therapy. And it was just a massive inflection point wow. where testosterone just like doubled or tripled. So, I mean, you start hearing enough of those anecdotes and then yours, it's like, well, you know, there's something here. And that's yeah. one of the areas I hope more and more research comes out, both the fertility and, uh, and testosterone. I mean, we know it's there and it's one of those things where you don't have to wait for the research yeah, to try it. using it. I mean, with red light therapy, it, it's really safe. Um, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I, I agree. And it's one of those things like, I, it's funny, I, I was following a, a bunch of different people on the kind of fertility journey, just on YouTube, like all the main fertility doctors, even the alternative ones that are like, you need to do this and do this cleanse and that cleanse and try this and try that. And, and I had seen in the comments, people would ask these different doctors or experts, what do you think about red light therapy? And they would, they would never acknowledge it, say waste of time, uh, nothing to it. You know, we don't think there's any, you know, don't, don't worry about that. Just do this protocol instead, buy my supplements. That's a fun one. Mm -hmm. Um, <laughs> I'm thinking like, God, all these women could be trying this and actually maybe seeing success instead of spending all their money on these supplements and cleanses and detox protocols. None of that stuff ever worked for me, by the way. You know, so I feel like it's something I would love to see more research on it as well, because I think it can help just hormonal health in general for women, even if you're not trying to get pregnant, hormonal health for women is probably the thing that I get messaged about the most because 70% of my followers are women, you know, and a lot of them are in that perimenopausal stage when everything is just starting to become a pain in the ass, you mm -hmm. know, and it's like, maybe getting a panel could help you deal with some of this, um, along with some lifestyle changes rather than going, jumping straight to HRT. It could be something that's helpful. You know, do you know that the, uh, the OO site is the most mitochondrial dense Yes, by far? Yes. It's not even close. It's like six, not even close to the brain. No, <laughs> not even it's, it's wild. So, yep. so my point there is, and we haven't even really, even really talked about this probably should have done this early on, but, uh, the mito how familiar is your audience with the mitochondria and it's like uh, they're, they're, they're getting there they're getting there <laughs> right that's actually one of the main reasons of why red light that's actually the reason why red light therapy can treat so many different things is because of the mitochondria so it's better to have this conversation late than never but yeah the mitochondria produces like 95 percent of the energy in our body and if you uh, look at Dr. Doug Wallace's research. Oh yeah, love his stuff. mitochondrial yeah. researcher in the world. He'll tell you that the more energy you have per cell, the slower you will age. In the complete opposite, the less energy you have per cell, the quicker you'll age. Um, and it's not energy like caffeine or anything. It's just that that to, uh, ATP. Cellular energy, energy, yeah. Yeah, that you need just to you know carry out daily functions. Uh, and so, if red light therapy can significantly improve your mitochondrial health. And your mitochondria produces all the energy in your body. Well, heck, that seems like a pretty good investment um, in, in, a, in a modality that's going to uh, scientifically prove and improve your mitochondrial health. Uh, and that's a whole other rabbit hole as far as going down all the implications of mitochondrial health. But right. uh, the more mitochondria you have in the tissue, probably the better it's going to respond to red light therapy. Also, the quicker it's going to go downhill if you have mitochondrial dysfunction, back to Dr. Doug Wallace, he would tell you that 80% of modern diseases are directly tied to mitochondrial dysfunction. We all know someone that has 
uh, died from or is suffering from mitochondrial dysfunction because mm -hmm. it's already generative. It can be um, even to your point, like dis uh, diabetes or mm -hmm. metabolic diseases or mood and behavioral disorders, Great. all types of pain. Um, it's directly tied to mitochondrial dysfunction. So again, if you can be proactive or even if you're suffering from something, help uh, reduce or prevent uh, these conditions simply with light, non-invasive, non-pharmacological, mm -hmm. uh, highly effective. I mean, it's almost too good to be true, like we've said, but uh, the research is there, the results are there, you've spoken about it and can attest to it. So if it's like someone sitting on the fence about red light therapy, I would tell them to invest in a smaller device, mm -hmm. try it on a couple of things you're, you're looking to improve health-wise and, and see what you notice before, you know, maybe dropping some big bucks on a bigger panel. But um, I think if people utilize the device correctly, they'll be blown away with the results they'll see. Yeah. And we didn't even get into the, you know, easy water in the body and how mm -hmm. red light can actually increase that fourfold, you know, up to fourfold, which is pretty astounding. I mean, since most people are dehydrated on a cellular level, we talked about that earlier, sitting in an office with, you know, flickering lights and just modern life, the non-native EMF aspect, we're all kind of in this you know, EMF soup. And it's like, if we can do red light therapy, increase that mitochondrial function, increase that cellular water. I mean, how much of a health benefit is that actually going to be? And then we talk about deuterium depleted water, you know, which is a whole other <laughs> rabbit hole, but you know, red light therapy is one of those things that is a natural deuterium depleter, which again, will increase mitochondrial function, will speed up those nanomotors and yeah, I mean, there's just, we could just literally talk about this stuff like all day because it's, it's that exciting, I think. It's a perpetual cycle, either if your mito, just to your point, like you were saying, if your mitochondria are dysfunctional, then it's going to like build upon itself to mm -hmm. create more mitochondrial dysfunction, more or lower energy status, lower hydration status. Mm -hmm. uh, but to your point, one of the byproducts of ATP production is that fourth phase of water. So yeah. if your cells don't have enough energy to produce, ATP, well, they're not going to be producing that fourth phase water. So yep. just kind of go hand in hand. And it's uh, not a coincidence that there are so many health uh, conditions and diseases directly tied to mitochondrial dysfunction. Yeah. Um, and I guess my point being like with mitochondrial dysfunction, the, these very mitochondrial dense tissues like the brain and the heart and the eyes, uh, while they require the most energy and they can respond quite well to red light therapy, they are the quickest to deteriorate as well, because mm -hmm. if, if those tissues are seeing mitochondrial dysfunction, well, uh, I mean, it's no coincidence that we have a lot of heart issues, a lot of eye issues, mm -hmm. and a lot of brain and mental health and, and otherwise issues, because uh, they fall the fastest when mitochondrial dysfunction comes on the scene. Yeah. And I mean, I, I just try to get people to zoom out a little bit. That's of course, Carrie and I are actually doing a fertility course that starts next week. We're trying to help women who have been in this boat of trying everything and, you know, not succeeding. And it's the fertility crisis is a, another health crisis. That's, that's a little more silent, but it's huge. I mean, when I was going through it, it was like, it's not just women, my age, right. Cause most women, my age have kids and they're like good to go start to have teenagers sending them off, you know? <laughs> No, I'm, I'm kind of in a unique situation, but being in the situation I was in, I, I found women in their thirties, women in their twenties. I mean, it's a, it's a huge thing. And the thing that Carrie and I continue to reiterate is that we have to zoom out on our health and see it as mitochondrial. Most of the things that people are dealing with, whether it's mental health, gut issues, autoimmune fertility, like all these things come down to the health of the mitochondria. So finding ways to support the mitochondria is going to be your path to wellness. It's going to be your path through these things. And, and we in al, you know, allopathic medicine just wants to separate out, you know, different organ systems. But when you look at things on that, on that level of the mitochondria, it's like, go ahead and keep spinning your wheels with these different supplement protocols and detoxes and this and the other, or let's zoom out a little bit and look at things a little bit more systemically. Right. 100%. Yeah. Awesome. Well, this has been, I, I feel like we've already been on for <laughs> an hour and 15. We could probably go longer. Um, but I really want my audience to know where they can find you, 
I definitely want to put a link to the book, not really book, the ebook that you've put out there so they can find that in, in, in all of your work. What's the best way for them to find that? Yeah, so um, put out a lot of information, Red Light Therapy Wise, of course, on, on the business uh, social media profile. So biolight.shop. Um, and then for same, that's a website for the products as well. So if you want to check out the ebook or um, honestly, the website is made as much a uh, learning platform as it is uh, to sell devices. So there's a lot, I mean, all the different sections in that book, pretty much all of those are covered on the website as well. The ebook adds on the newest research and some of the protocols. Uh, as far as the ebook itself, I just got it on Amazon yesterday. So if you like the Kindle version better, it's on there now. And I guess the only perk I could think of of the Kindle version is that since this is almost a 170 page ebook at this point, instead of having to scroll through the entire PDF, oh, which is the version that's on the BioLite website, you could go to the table of contents and just click on a certain section and it'll take you straight there. So um, again, the Kindle version's on Amazon. Uh, and then you can follow me personally on Instagram uh, at Dr. Mike Belkowski. Mike Belkowski on LinkedIn. And if anyone has questions, just send a DM through BioLite or my personal Instagram profile or LinkedIn. And, you know, I'm more than happy to answer questions because uh, for me, really, that's what it's all about is educating the masses so people can understand the potential, you know, healing uh, powers of red light therapy. Because the more that people know, I think we can really uh, move the needle in the right direction and have people bec become less reliant on allopathic medicine mm -hmm. and, and uh, big pharma, so to speak. There's a time and place for each, but I think, you know, of course the pendulum has swung pretty darn far to one side. So, you know, given a tool for people to take health back into their own hands is, is empowering. And that's kind of what it's all about for me. Agree. That's awesome. Well, thank you again for being here. This is such a great chat. I know so many people are going to enjoy it and uh, yeah. Thanks for coming on. Thanks for having me, Sarah. You're so welcome.